manager for a charity um, that works out of Ireland, um, specifically out of Northern Ireland. Yep. And ultimately, I'll be talking a wee bit, first of all, about the Red Squirrels United project, which is a project that I would work on with uh, Craig and a number of other partners around the United Kingdom. Um, and I have to say, great presentation by Craig, as always. Um, I always learn something when I speak to Craig, um, not least of the calibre of the Welsh rugby team, which I'll not go too much into, because um, I've been told by Pierre not to talk about rugby. Um, but um, effectively, I guess I'll, I'll, set the, I'll set the context of the discussion that we're about to have with information. We're very much of the mind frame. Can everybody hear me okay? We're very much of the mind frame that ultimately conservation needs to come from communities. And whenever I, whenever I first joined Ulster Wildlife, um, I was 25, 26, my knees were quaking, and I remember the president of our organisation taking me under the wing and going out for a coffee. And the first thing he said to me was, forget everything you know about the environment, because conservation is about people. Um, ultimately, when it comes to invasive species management, in this case, red squirrel conservation and grey squirrel management, it's always going to be about the communities and the people that we work with. So, in terms of Red Squirrels United, um, I'm going to give you a wee quick overview about the project and then we're going to delve into um, Ireland and the conservation picture as is there. So, effectively, Red Squirrels United, it's the first UK-wide attempt at uh, securing the future of Red Squirrels. It's taken a lot of work. Um, it's about, been about three years worth of development for a four-year project, so it has. Um, ultimately, whenever you involve so many different organisations and so many different volunteers, you're always going to have social issues at play. Um, and that is one of the things we will talk about, but it is also one of the greatest benefits um, that comes out of conservation when you have so many different perspectives at play. It's the largest invasive species management programme in Europe. Um, it represents a significant investment um, by LIFE and by HLF which is our Heritage Lottery Fund of about £3 million. And it's a scientifically robust programme of conservation. It's effectively united um, all of the Red Squirrel practitioners in terms of conservation practitioners, but also a lo quite a lot of different academic institutions which have come together to evaluate the work that we've been doing. And it's been working on the protection of the nine main remaining strongholds for Red Squirrels in Northern Ireland, England and Wales. So what's our mission? Um, effectively, the Red Squirrels United, it sounds like a really, really bad football team. What it's about is actually bringing together local communities and local people um, and empowering them. Effectively, money, this money won't last forever. And our communities play a big, big part in the legacy of any work that we go on to do. Um, it's about monitoring the squirrel populations and trying to prevent the further spread of invasive non-native grey squirrels. You've heard about the work that Craig has done. That work has to keep going um, in order to prevent grey squirrels from moving back into Anglesey. Um, likewise, in all of the other areas, we have, as I said, about 40 different red squirrel conservation groups across the United Kingdom. That work is always ongoing, but it has been done by volunteers who are taking that forward. It's about unpinning our conservation work with the latest scientific research. So we have a number of different types of studies. There's ecological studies that are being undertaken, looking at the, um, the effort required to eradicate grey squirrels from certain areas. That has been done by Newcastle University. Um, but likewise, we're also looking at the sociological um, evidence for grey squirrel management and looking at the barriers for why some certain individuals and organisations do not like the idea of grey squirrel management, but also looking at what is the most appetising or palatable way of encouraging red squirrel conservation uh, techniques. And of course it's about sharing knowledge with you guys. We are learning from you um, and we have things that we can share with you as well, things that, that work um, and uh, things that we have found to work. We've made mistakes but we've also learned new things and it's about bringing all these conservation efforts together and uh, informing one another. So, um, this is the project landscape. Um, you can see in the north of England and the and west of England there, there are two small red spots. These are effectively the only areas that we currently have strongholds of red squirrels left. Um, there's a, 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 if you actually look at the document for the for the project here, you can actually see the impact the grey squirrels have made moving across England and Ireland. 
Um, that is not a situation you want in continental Europe. Um, we are now looking at um, a couple of remaining landscapes where we still have red squirrels, and that is only after 100 years in Ireland's context um, of grey squirrels being introduced. Um, the four areas that you can see on the map there, and we will show you the presence absence survey as we go along, are effectively the four areas that we still only have red squirrels. Um, effectively, the whole of the middle of Northern Ireland is now grey, and likewise the whole of the east and middle of the Republic Ireland is a grey area as well. So, I was told by Valentina that basically focused on a lot of the community work that we're doing. And in order to work with the community, we need to have an idea of what the community think. Um, as I mentioned, uh, Forest Research um, undertook a public attitude survey where they looked at um, what people thought about grey squirrel management and also what they thought about the certain types of management techniques. Now, it was an interesting, um, it was an interesting survey, first of all, in a number of different cases. Some of the things we already knew. We realised, for example, that things like cranial dispatch weren't widely, I mean, they were, they were accepted by about 40%, 50% of the population. Where red squirrel conservation work had been ongoing, that increased by as much as up to 80%, where people said, we want the reds there, this is a necessary evil. Um, in Northern Ireland, for example, where red squirrel conservation activity has been relatively limited over the last 20 years, that was much less, about 50%. But we found um, that the public could be broken up into four um, or five different types of segments. I'm not sure if you can, you probably can't read that, but at the top we have squirrel rejectors, people who just aren't interested in squirrels of any type and do not care. Um, that was about 9% of the population fell into that category. Wildlife ambivalence, these are people that like seeing squirrels feeding in their garden, um, whether it's red or grey. They make up about 8%. Um, General, sorry, that was general squirrel appreciators, that was about 55%. Wildlife ambivalence, those are people that just like wildlife but aren't really willing to take any, um, any action, that makes up about 8%. So your general squirrel appreciators, it's about 55%, squirrels in the garden type folk. And then you have your active wildlife enthusiasts. These are your conservationists, these are people who are undertaking green consumerism and these are people who are active already in undertaking work to protect the environment. Um, they fall into a category of about 26 different per percent of people. Um, and then you have a relatively low po population, relatively low segment, which is about 2%. These are your extreme animal welfare and rights advocates who just do not want animals to be killed whatsoever. Now, for each of these different segments, in order for us to take them on a journey where they understand the implications that grey squirrels can have on the ecosystem and on other species, we need to have different communication messages and we have different starting points. Um, and I would say as well that a lot of the, um, I mean, you're talking about 55, 26, you're talking about 81% of people are generally interested in red squirrels or in squirrels in general. And that's quite high, actually, when we looked at it. And one of the things that I think we can look at is the fact that um, in the UK and Ireland, we were all brought up with things like, for example, in the, tough, the top right, the Tufty Club. Basically, a guy that dressed up as a red squirrel to teach you how to cross the road safely. And we also grew up with the things like Squirrel Knocking, um, Beatrix Potter book, and these are very much enshrined within British and, to an extent, within Irish culture as well. So red squirrels are already have a higher level of starting. So this is the ladder of engagement. This is one of the things that the Red Squirrels United organisation or the project takes whenever it is um, engaging with the community. And what we need to be aware of is that different communities have different starting points. So you have informed on the first rung and you have involved on the second, engaged on the third, collaborating on the fourth, and empowered on the fifth. And there's different activities that we undertake in order to bring people up the next rung of the ladder. That is ultimately what we're trying to do, is to empower and get people collaborating on conservation action, because that is when they can be most effective. Now, each rung can effectively be broken down into three other sections. Education how to get people informed about what the problem is. Believe it or not, we are still seeing people who think grey squirrels are the good squirrel. They're the squirrel that should be here. So there are messages that we still need to put out. Involving people then. Um, this is about, I guess, involving and engaging is about inducing participation. This is about creating opportunities where people can go, for example, on a red squirrel safari and actually experience red squirrels. Or they can build a feeder so that they can feed red squirrels at home. 
Then you have what you hopefully get to is the stage of spontaneous participation. And this is effectively the stage where all of a sudden communities become engaged. They become active. They start creating groups. They start undertaking camera trapping of their own back. That is effectively when you as an organisation start giving away power to those community groups and saying this is now yours. And while we're going to be here to help you, it is one of the first, most frustrating things in the world to see a group take their own action and say we're going to ignore the advice you're given but we're going to do it this way. It's frustrating but it is ultimately what we are trying to achieve as well um, because ultimately we want community groups to take advantage, become masters of their own ship and, take uh, and start taking control of conservation in their own area. So how do we go about that? Um, so the first stage is ultimately about information, it's about getting information out there. Um, the project's had quite a lot of um, exposure over the last wee while. Um, we've had a national press campaign, Craig mentioned on it, uh, or mentioned it a little while ago, um, where the Guardian piece came up, for example, Kill, 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 the project looking for a squirrel army. Um, unfortunately, that sort of chat didn't go down very well in Northern Ireland, but it was something that got people interested and got people coming along and got those messages out. So you can see um, the, the interest that's out there. Um, it's, something that, it's something that has also set the tone for other discussions within, within England, Scotland, Wales and Northern Ireland as well. For example, where we have red squirrels is very much towards the north part of England and it almost turned into a north versus south, red squirrels versus grey squirrels um, sort of conversation as well. So let's look at the next rung of the ladder then. Um, engagement and involving uh, people within the work that they're doing. So I've stole a slide um, and some of the facts from uh, Res Worlds Northern England for this one. Effectively, if on, the, on the left hand side you can see the results of an annual survey uh, that Res Worlds Northern England undertake every year. Um, the green areas are where they have seen absolutely no squirrels. The reds, obviously, where they've seen reds. The yellow is where they've seen both species, and the grey is where they've seen just grey species only. Now, that is a significant um, uh, undertaking. That is done. Effectively, you can see the pie chart there on the right hand side. There's 150 volunteers that aren't also volunteers from local groups, just to differentiate them. Um, 150 volunteers took part in their survey. They carried out 50% of the monitoring and survey work in that area. And then you have the local red squirrel groups. Again, most of these guys are also volunteers. It's just that they're further along that collaboration stage. They undertook an additional 110 woods, um, another 40% of the effort. Effectively, paid staff were only responsible for 13% of the monitoring and survey work that un was undertaken in Northern England. Um, and this is one of the ongoing things within squirrel conservation. It's effectively this sort of thing that we're engaging with now um, ourselves in Northern Ireland. So what are the processes? Effectively, what you want to do is start out with training, get people again informed, give them the tools necessary, that is the knowledge, to go out and give them the equipment that's required to do it. Allow them to experience red squirrels as well. A lot of people actually, there was a, there was a study done in Northern Ireland where they looked at um, real wildlife versus mythical wildlife. And a lot of people were actually saying that red squirrels were like unicorns in that they didn't exist. Um, again, it's about giving people that sort of information to say they do exist and they are here. It's also about thanking them. Um, effectively, when it comes down to volunteers, they do it out of their own free will. You need to make sure that they feel appreciated. Um, you need to make sure that they're thanked. So we ran thank you events. One of the key things about thank you events is tea and cake. Um, people will come, they will move mountains for tea and cake, so they will, and we always got the volunteer, it was all, it's also a very efficient way of getting back your equipment, but that's neither here nor there. And also, we all, also created small things like key rings, um, those key rings were done by another volunteer, um, and it's just a nice wee thing that they can say, I've taken part in this, and it's something that they can go on and uh, they can keep hold of now. So fast forward one year later, we've done the community engagement work, and this is the results. We undertook a survey, almost thoroughly done by volunteers, of the entire, entirety of Northern Ireland. Um, we effectively did around 250 different woodlands. Um, effectively what we found was that um, we found a lot more new red squirrel sites. 
sites that we didn't actually know even existed. And you can see, for example, in the east, um, up in North Down, there's two solitary red squares. Those are populations we didn't know existed. And they are now populations that we're beginning to form a group around. Again, when it comes to red squirrel conservation, people don't go out and kill red squirrels or control them just for the sake of it. It always has to be done with reds in mind. And that is a, that is a hugely lubricating and galvanizing force. What we also found um, in the camera traps that, we've, that, that we put out was that there has been a reduction in the grey squirrel population, uh, or distribution certainly. Um, you can see, the, if you can see the, the cursor there, this is County Fermanagh. And in 2015 we found three or four different squares with grey squirrel presence. Um, I mentioned about the fact that the, the project took so long to develop, it took about two and a half, three years. Well, in 2015, we were given uh, research that showed that there were grey squirrels in Fermanagh. This was the first time we were aware of grey squirrels making it into County Fermanagh. It, was, it seemed just another step in their invasion of uh, new areas of Northern Ireland. Fast forward two years later, 2017, what we found actually that those grey squirrel populations had disappeared. They did not exist. Now, we don't know whether this falls into the, all of the research that's been done on high pine marking pin, or, or densities and their natural control of grey squirrels or whether it's something else. Craig, for example, was talking about the natural burnout of frontier species. But we do know, and you can look at the pine marking population here, uh, the, the, the distribution across the area, 41% of sites in Fermanagh had pine marking. And that's increasing. In fact, what we started finding is that pine marten, which were historically persecuted um, by pheasant shooters, for example, in Northern Ireland, are now in the middle of Belfast, um, which really excited people, so it did. So pine marten are continuing their recovery as well. A lot of this data would not exist without volunteers. 80% of all of the survey work we undertook was as a result of volunteers. Only 20% was actually done by our staff. So that's engaging and involving people. What the next step then is, okay, so we have a lot of these, and the presence absence survey has been great for this because you give people a camera trap, you give them a wood, and they go out and do the job. But what you then want to do is actually get them working together, get them to talk to one another, creating those networks between each other where they can then become a bit more organized and a bit more set up around certain woodlands. So whenever we find out the red squirrels were still hanging on just outside of Belfast, the next step was to get everybody together that had been taking part in a survey and that was interested in it. Um, basically by calling for a red squirrel and pine marking community meeting. I did have some jokers asking if people were invited or was it just for red squirrels and pine marking. Um, but effectively we got a turnout of about 56 people who are now helping to control grey squirrels within woodlands where we found the reds, where we traditionally found the reds. But more than that, what they're also doing is beginning to find new populations of red squirrels which we didn't know existed either. And um, the idea is then that what we want to try and do is bring red squirrels back across the range of North Down. But it's not just about the creation of local groups that we need to collaborate on. Actually, there's a much bigger picture and it's already been alluded to in some of the information that we've had. What we want to try and do is get everybody interested in red squirrel conservation collaborating together. Because as a movement then, we're a lot stronger. And as well as that, it's a lot better for conservation in terms of what we can deliver. But also it's about how we deliver it. What we want to do, for example, the animal welfare argument has quite rightly been, uh, been asked about today already. So we want to make sure that, um, that all, of this, all of the actions that all of the partners are doing um, actually uh, meet animal welfare um, targets. As a result of this, what we've undertaken is we've looked at creating a forum across Northern Ireland. This is made up of statutory bodies, such as the Department of Agriculture, Environment and Rural Affairs, and also Forest Service. It's made up of the private sector. Certain estates, for example, who are worried about the um, impacts grey squirrels have on commercial forestry. Academic institutions like Queen's University. It's also made up of third sector organisations, which I would include would Ulster Wildlife would be part of. Um, organisations like the National Trust, the British Association for Shooting and Conservation. But also, importantly, the grassroots community groups as well. Um, they effectively do a lot of the legwork when it comes to grey squirrel management here. 
And the likes of the Glen's Red Squirrel Group, we only have red squirrels in the Glen's of Antrim at the minute because of the action of these grassroots groups, and we need to be aware of that. But also the Ring of Gullion, the North West Red Squirrel Group, who will who'll actually be using as a, as a case study as we go forward. And the importance of collaborating at that level means that what you've got, you have a forum where you can create best practice and develop it. According to, um, according to new science. So things like, for example, we've got a squirrel hygiene protocol, which effectively looks at if there's a gray squirrel on your feeder, what do you do? How do you minimize the spread of squirrel pox? You know, you take it down, you disinfect it, you put it back up again. If you've got red squirrel with pox, given the fact that they are greater spreaders, you incinerate the feeder, you stick a new one up. Um, so we look, at, we look at squirrel hygiene as well, and, and feeder and trap hygiene as well, to try and minimise the spread of these diseases and the diseases like adenovirus that, uh, that Craig was talking about. But what we also do is we look at grey squirrel control. And effectively what we say is, the legislation says this, but in, in, in Northern Ireland you're never too far away from a red squirrel. So you also think about the fact that if you're trapping, two checks a day minimum, because what you don't want to do, if it's a red squirrel that's in there, you're obviously going to hamper your own conservation impacts. So we design this sorts of information. Um, and that gives everybody, like the Northwest Red Squirrel Group, a good standing that they are comfortable, that they know exactly what is expected of them in terms of red squirrel conservation. So let's look at these guys. The Northwest Red Squirrel Group, they're a relatively small grassroots group. Um, the lady second from the left used to actually coach me at football. That's Pam. Now Pam's about mid-60. She does a lot of work with this group. Um, of the 30 members, seven are retired, one's a farmer, two are master's students, one is a secondary school, or a secondary school teacher, there's a conservationist in there, two engineers and a tradesman. You're talking about all different sectors of the communities we are, that, are, that are in there. Now, the Northwest group had an issue, and this is where the strength of the forum comes in and, and collaboration on that bigger scale. Actually, it's about empowerment, as we're going to talk about. The Northwest Group had, a, had an issue. Um, there's a small woodland here um, called the Muff Glen. It's a woodland that I actually played in as a boy. Now, it's a two kilometre walk from the back of the woodland to the car park. Forest Service, which own the woodland, do not allow shooting on, on, on site. So, what they used to have to do is take the grey squirrel, um, move it to the car park, which was a two kilometre walk, dispatch the squirrel by shooting um, and then take, the, take a new trap back or else disinfect the trap and take it back. So you're talking about a four kilometre walk for every single grey squirrel that was undertaken. Now even though they were requiring that, they were still dispatching about 40 squirrels in that wood um, a year so they were. So this project started, we had a great idea. All right. These things are called kinase traps, they're kill traps. Um, effectively, they're a non-species -specific, non specific trap that you bait and stick to a tree. In Ireland, um, or in Northern Ireland certainly, um, because we all have devolved laws, um, they're actually illegal to be used in that way because we have so many small fragmented populations of red squirrel and because we're also seeing pine marten making a comeback. So they're illegal like this, but if you actually affix them to the trap, then because you know the species that's in the trap, and we have um, statutory guidance now on this, you are allowed to use it in this context for grey squirrels. Effectively, we introduced this manner of trapping and dispatch to Pam and her cohort. And fast forward to 2018, um, instead of the 45 squirrels that they managed to do in, uh, in 2017, they're on a total count so far of 105, um, and we're only talking about four months in. More than that, they've actually managed to take the step of moving outside of the woodland that they currently work in, Muff Glen. And they've started taking, they've started moving into the other woodlands that used to have red squirrels. They've started moving into the likes of Brahen Parks and Columns Park. They've started moving into um, the likes of Ina Lock. These are woodlands that used to have reds. People still fondly remember them. But, for example, in Brahen, they're no longer there. So effectively, um, yeah. So effectively, uh, I guess, in terms of ladder engagement, that's your empowerment. Um, so I'll just finish off there. Um, if you want to get involved with the project, you can follow us on Twitter, ch ch chat to us on Facebook, or head to the website. Um, and in addition, if you want anything else, then there's emails there that you're more than welcome to get in touch with, okay? Thank you.